All right, let's get into the word today. You know, um, I'm excited about this series where we're, we, are, we are charting our, our, our course, we're charting our direction, we are setting the path and the pace and the direction of Citadel Church. Uh, it's not a new thing, but we're making it very clear. We're, we want to make sure that everyone knows what we're working on. In years ago, I, I would, you know, I think it was in the 90s when um, Tiger Woods took a, a, a whole year off. You guys don't follow golf, but if you, if you did, you would know in the 90s he took a whole year off and he disappeared. It was like he was just in incognito. It's just like, where did he go? Is he done? And then he came back. When he came back, he came back and he dominated the, the, the field in such a way that they were talking about changing the rules of golf. He was so dominant. I mean, he was so dominant. He won every coat. He won everything. And, and, they, and, and then they revealed what happened in that year he took off, the year that he was in a hiding position. They broke everything. They broke his, they broke his grip. They broke his swing. They had to break everything in order to reinvent him. In order to make him a champion, he had to go through the breaking process. And it's extremely important that you know if you're going to go, you're going to be a champion, you're going to have to go through a season where you are maybe exposed at one point and then you go into a hiding because a hiding is a place of preparation so that you can come out and dominate the field like never before. They literally, I mean, it, I mean, it, was, it was the most amazing thing because it was like, okay, he has another coat. Okay, he has another coat. You know, you know when you win a certain, certain titles, you get the coats. And that's like the, I mean, he won everything. He was dominating everything. And they were like, it's completely unfair. But what did they do? I mean, they, they, they said it was unfair to the point that they wanted to change the rules. I mean, can you imagine being the person that they changed the rules of golf around to make it fair for everyone else? How could you do that? How could you take someone who is so, so outlier in, in their ability that, and, and actually change the rules and make a curve for everyone else? And I, and I want you to know what we're doing at Citadel Church right now is we're breaking our grip. We're breaking, we're breaking our swing. We're breaking our, our, our hip posture. We're breaking everything. We're breaking the clubs. We're breaking everything because we are in the season where we can't go continue to do church the way church has been done because we saw church break last year in 2020. We saw it break down. We saw churches as the uh, non-essential, I mean, voted by every governmental position, non-essential. I want you to know the church has, doesn't need permission to be essential from a government. Amen. I'm just saying. Amen. We are essential because we are the only thing, we are truly the last man standing. And when you, and when you know, when you know, when you know that you're the absolute last one that's going to be standing, that the, that the, that the governments of this world will not be standing, period. They will not be standing. The, 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 the education system of this world will not be standing, period, at the end of this. And we can go through every one of them. The business, which we invest in, we give the attention to business, not because we think business is going to be standing. We think business is designed in its sacredity to, to actually fund the kingdom of God. So the, the purpose behind business is not just to go and do business, but it's for the sake of funding that which is the business of our father. And we, we must know that church is not going to stand the same, but those that we bring through the church will stand. Right? The church will not be the same. When we get to heaven, there will be no Starbucks cups. There'll be none of the stuff that we use to get people in. There will only be disciples. It will only be disciples. Everything else that's used, the lights will not make it. The fog machines won't make it. All of that is just to be attractive enough to get people in the room and hold them their attention long enough to where we can get them to become a disciple. Now, problem is, is you can bring a person, you can, you can, you can catch a, you can catch a kind of fish that is not edible, that it was not processable. So you have to know that there is, you can do a lot of things to catch them, but if they aren't willing to be cleaned up to be what you want them to be, then you're actually going to just, uh, wasting your time, right? You're just, 
You have to understand that it's, it's important that we understand in this season of Citadel Church when we're stepping into a micro church mandate, a micro church vision. It's not just something that we said, well, what did we come up with? No, it was something that we started to have God talk about the la five, five years ago, at least five years ago. Uh, and he started to talk about how he wanted us to focus on what was happening to the synagogues in, in synagogues in Israel, what was happening with Starbucks on every corner. What, he started talking about all of these, these components. And so we started to dream about it. How could we do it? I remember having a conversation with Steve Carpenter when we came back from Israel and sharing the vision of what we want to do. And he goes, well, do it, because that's what we, we envision as well. And, he, and he's like, I said, well, you know, we don't have a, we, we need a, we need a process. It, we need a, we need a way to break it. I mean, you know, you need a way to break it because every, you need a way to break it. You need something. And so I said, well, we need an opportunity. And then all of a sudden COVID comes around. Thank you, COVID. It's an opportunity for us to come back and with something that, that, that we're rebuilding because we didn't break it. It was broken by a society. Amen. So it allows us to rebuild. And I know that there's a lot of people, their goal is just to get back to what was happening before COVID. But once COVID Delta Z, whatever shows up and, you know, and the, the vaccine mandates and all the stuff that's trying to be pushed starts to show up. You need to know that you have a response that is not going to be uh, tolerating Nonsense. We, no nonsense, no jab. I mean, we, we, all right, so John. So in this, God's been unfolding. And online, you, there'll, be, there'll be an image that comes up so that you can see it. But in the room here, I'm going to draw on this, on this, 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 this whiteboard here. Because there is something that's important for us to know that God has been strategizing and it goes back many many years and I'm, I repeat for the sake of most people come to church once a month so if I sound repetitive because you come every week it's because I'm talking to the person that comes once a month all right all right so so just for the sake of being repetitive now God is working on us and the first thing he told us the first thing he told us when we started the church and, and again, this will all fold into your life. It will all fold into your life. This will make sense to you. What God said is the first thing, the priority of our lives is presence. Someone present, someone say presence. I'm going to, I'm not going to use this one. I'm going to use a flat because I like to have it a fatter draw. <laughs> all right. The first thing, the first thing God wants is presence. Up here, the, ultimately the goal, and, he, and it was amazing because we spent two years, two years learning what the presence of God was to him. The panim, the panim means the face of God. Moses says, I will not go unless your panim goes with me, which is your presence in translation, but he says your face. So we spent two years not learning the essence of God, but we spent two years learning how to find his face. How do you see God and find his face? And then he, he, then he started to reveal to us that there was, uh, relevance to that relevance is where the miracle started breaking out. The person would come and they would be in the presence of God and then God would heal. And then we spent another two years learning discipleship. Now this discipleship was not just a normal kind of discipleship. Let's study the Bible together, but it was a kind of believer. We are not just trying to make a kind of person who knows how to read the Bible, but a specific kind of believer. A person who believes a certain way. And the thing that we're going we're gonna to uncover this one today. And then the, 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 the fourth thing is he said there needed to be a movement of care. I got to discipleship and I said, Lord, when is it going to break out? When is it going to happen? When is it going to do this thing that we've been talking about? And he says, when you finally get the movement of care down. When you finally understand how to make care happen in people's lives. When you finally understand no, to, how to not just care for one person, but to care for a whole system. To create systems that bring about transformation of change. Transformation and change. It's extremely important that we learn how to transform people. And that we don't only learn how to transform them, but we learn how to transform the systems that they're in. Right now, there's, you have to understand this, this, this here is an eight-year process. And this has taken longer. This has been a five-year process. 
learning how to do this. Because it's not just about how to feed people and how to put shoes on them and how to close them, but how do we make sure that they never ever need shoes again? How do we make sure that the system is changed to where the, the mama and grandma is going, grandma goes into a, a home and she's not just shoved in the corner looking at a wall, and, but she's actually taken care of and her mind is being renewed and being strengthened. How do we do that in such a way that we can have systemic change? We can have systemic change where a person's life is of quality and not just a, a bunch of people quantity. The church has been stuck in quantity that we don't have quality. We are all so busy. Oh, we're going to get a million people, a thousand people, a billion people. That's right. That's fine. Because it's easy to get people to flock to what you give them. But if you want to train them and develop them and encourage them and build them and make them better than they are and dream of them, dream with them, then you've got to do something completely different. This has taken a longer time. This has taken about five years. God started talking to us about the movement of care and we try to figure it out. So then in the midst of this, he talked to us about leadership. Someone say leadership. Leadership. He showed us that every time he increased the presence of the Lord, he increased our re leadership responsibility. We needed to raise up more leaders. Every time the presence of God sweeps in, the move of God comes, it bursts things, it breaks stuff. And then we got to find out what, who, what, what happened to that leader, what happened to that, what happened to that person, right? And this became now what we are learning as I'm learning in this season. This is, this is our builders. This is when we are builders presence, being in the face of God and being a leader. That's what we see Joshua and Moses being in the face of God and being a leader. God raised up Joshua in the midst of the, the presence of the Lord. His next, his succession plan came from being in the presence of God. When God, when you get in the presence of God, he thinks about leadership and this, be, this makes someone a builder. Someone say builder. In this, we found out that relevance, where miracles break out, where signs, wonders, and great things happen, that there was a counterbalance called organizational discipline. Being disciplined in your organization, organizing your life to where you're disciplined, making sure that whatever you gain here, you don't lose it here. Isn't it beautiful? If God gives you 15 eggs, don't lose any of those eggs. Keep them all, right? Put them in a car, do something, organize those things. Jesus said, I've lost none that you've given me, I've, except the one that you've designed to be lost. And so this, this one, we have to understand that God has made us rulers over things. Rulers. I'm, 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 I'm building a profile, a profile. You see it? a profile. So these two things, when you have, when you're working with someone, we need to, we're going to work on building with you. We're going, to, we're going to develop you into a builder. What, we, what we're talking about is we're going to add more presence of God and more leadership in your life. We're going to teach you what ruling is all about. Destroying the works of the devil and helping you never have that work ever come again. He said, when you destroy the works of the devil, trample on it. Trample, right? They have dominion is what it is. After you subdue it, dominate it. That's what this is. We're going to trample and we're going to dominate. That's a ruler. Someone say, we're going to rule. We're going to rule over the things that used to rule over us. We're going to take down everything that used to control us. Come on. We're, gonna, we're not going to have any nonsense. I'm just here. I'm just, we're not going to have any nonsense. We're not going to have any nonsense. So in this, we know then the next phase is which we're talking about today, which this is what then you have the disciple, the discipler or the disciple who's based upon faith, love, hope, and joy. We'll see that. And then, but this person has to be a person that executes executes now that's the counterbalance of it and this person is an advancer an advancer advance yes there advancer so when we when we're looking at building rebuilding we're breaking things for the sake of rebuilding it into its proper shape we're not just haphazardly doing something 20 years from now this will be a standard all right I wish I had someone that would just hear me. You're like 20 years, 20 years from now, this will be a standard because we're building it intentionally. And when you know you build something intentionally, you start with the foundation. You don't discourage, you don't get discouraged that it's not the roof. You look at the foundation because this is the standard, the gold standard. This is the standard. Are you understanding? Because systematically God said, this is how you plant revival. When you plant revival, it's going to spring forth into a, a, a church. 
And so if we can do this in Auburn, and we can do this in Ken, and we can do this in Sammamish, if we can do this in these locations, these are the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit locations. If we can do it in these locations, then we can have a breakout. We can do it here. We can do it anywhere. We can do it anywhere. We can throw someone over there with this in them, and they know exactly the blueprint of how to build it out. Anywhere. We'll throw you in Dubai. We'll throw you in right there. You just go presence, leadership. Relevance, organizational discipline, discipleship, execution. What, what are you saying? You are a builder, a ruler, an advancer, and I'm not telling you the next one. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, Come back next week. So you have to understand. Let's go to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. So this is what we're working on. This is what we're working on. And this is, what this, this, uh, this is why we're here. In Sammamish. Amen. And that's why we're here in Kent. And that's why we're here in, in, in Auburn. That's why we're here. We're here building something purposefully, intentionally. And when you know it's intentional, it's not, well, what are you guys doing? It's just half haphazardly. No, we're not going to a conference and actually studying someone else. We're going to f this place right here called Presence. To the panim of God and say, God, what do you want for Citadel Church? And he told me, it's not for everybody. It's not for everybody, but I know it's for us. And that's what I need to know. I don't need to know. I know what they do. I remember when I realized that what Joel Osteen does is not for me. I realized it, but I love Joel. And he, I mean, he's a hero. He's a hero to me. I just, I admire what he does. But I knew that it was his blueprint. It was the thing that God needed for him. It was the thing that God had for him. I know that there's other people that are doing their blueprint, but God said this is going to be a standard for those who want to do this yes. right yes. and you have to have that standard so in this we're going to come back to this in a moment someone say advancers advancers, advancers are people that move things forward advancers i was at a football game yesterday and i saw some advancers I saw some people that were advancing, moving things forward. I saw some people that were holding advancement back, right? We need to know everything in life is about how you advance. Yeah. It's not just advancing, but how you advance. Because yeah. if you advance in the wrong thing, let's, let's say if, you, if your nose is broken, been around boxers all my life. If your nose is broken and it doesn't get corrected properly in the beginning, it will advance in a wrong direction. And then if you ever want to get it right, come on, crooked nose. If you ever want to get it right, you got to go and break it again so that it will grow into the right direction. You can advance in the wrong direction. Someone say it, advance in the wrong direction. John chapter 2. <laughs> John chapter 2, verse 1. One of the greatest stories, I think, in the Bible. And Jesus is being revealed here in verse 1. It says in... And on the, the third day, there was a wedding of Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And now both Jesus and his disciples, say Jesus, Jesus. and his disciples. So Jesus is walking with disciples. He has people that are learning and growing. And, and you have to understand that a disciple is not just someone who wants to hang out with you, but a disciple is chosen to follow you to learn your ways to learn your way, the way you do things, to learn the way you are structured your life, to learn the way you live, to learn the way you wake up and you go to bed. That's why they're following him. They're following him to learn how he does it. How does he get in the face of God? How does he lead people? So he's not leading people just because they want to hang out with him. He's leading them because they want his ways. And then, then, then he, he, is, he is establishing them. And our discipleship, remember, we're going to break it down, but it's in faith, love, and, and, and hope. So you have to understand. So Jesus has these disciples, and they were all invited to the wedding. In verse 3, it says, And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. They, so she comes to Jesus. She says, Jesus, we have no more wine. Jesus is there enjoying the wedding as everybody else. And so he responds in an interesting way. <laughs> We have no wine. And Jesus said to, said to her, woman, I don't know how he was able to get, get I, I just, I don't know how he was able to get away with that. But, but it's like, it's all in the tone. <laughs> woman, what does your concern, now this is a great question. What does your dis concern have to do with me? What does the thing you're concerned with have to do with me? And then he says, yet, my hour, my hour has not yet come. So he's thinking there's a time 
that's designed for me to do these kinds of things. But what is, what are you, this is not my concern. This is your concern. And I love this because it says the next verse, it says in verse five, his mother. I mean, see, see, it's very clear that this is trying to make it clear that, that he is not talking to just some normal woman. This is mama. And whatever mama's concerned with immediately becomes your concern. This is what he's realizing because he's like, okay, I'm with my kids, my boys, I'm with my disciples. I'm hanging with them. You, right? So what, what, you, you know, we, but, but the realization when it comes down to it, it's his mother. Now you have to understand the Jewish mindset of a mother. The Jewish mindset of a mother is the father doesn't train them, which means disciple them. The mother disciples them all their lives. The mother decides she's the teacher and the father at bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah takes over responsibilities of training them to be man. But they are still under the training and the tutelage of mama. She is the discipler. She, that means no matter how big he gets, he is disciple of mama. I wish I had someone here. So which means that he has to do what the Bible says when you are under mama and papa, honor the honor them as if they're God. And so he knows what he has to respond. So she knows as well. She didn't even have a response. She just walks away. Now watch. I'm talking about discipleship. I'm talking about discipleship here. She says she didn't even say it to him. She says to those around us, his mother said to the servants. What you, what, what he says to you, do it. Someone say, do it. Now I love this. This she's so, she's so confident in her discipleship over him that she can start talking to other people about what he's about to do. And she never has to respond to him again. That's discipleship. That's discipleship. Come on, say discipleship. Now this is important that we get this, that the disciple has to be someone who executes. What does she say to him? Whatever she says, she goes to him because she knows I have a problem and my problem is executed by my disciples. I have a problem and my, the solution of my problem is found in my disciples. I wish I had someone that would say amen. Cause you know, I'm about to give you some problems. And how you respond to them determines on whether or not you're my disciple. Because a disciple is for the sake of executing. I teach you by executing something. You understand? I teach you by executing. See, we always thought discipleship was sitting down and do a Bible study, but that's not how you learn. You learn by being sent into something. You learn by being sent in, come on somebody, by being sent. See, my grandmother asked me a question once when I was going to do a, my first crusade on the hilltop. I was going to do my first crusade. I said, mama, I'm going to do a crusade on the hilltop. She goes, oh yeah? I said, yeah. She goes, Were you, are you sent or did you just went? Well, I said I was swent. See, because disciples don't went, disciples are sent. And the fact is, is that God wants to, <laughs> he will give you an opportunity. And Jesus couldn't go into his ministry until he actually activated the scent in his life. It's the reason the micro churches are working is because they were sent. These leaders are sent. These leaders were t literally said, we need you to do this. Yeah. Yeah. And they didn't go, well, we don't want to. Right. We said, well, we need you to do it. Will you do it? And they go, okay, we'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We need worship. Okay. Well, you know, Miss Angie, yeah. she goes and gets herself a keyboard yeah. and she just gets up and she stays up at 12 o'clock at night, midnight, yeah. doing a, doing a class, wow. right. learning the keys because she is sent. You have to understand when you're a disciple, yes. your, your, your discipleship is manifest by what you execute. Yes. 
by what you advance. What, what, you're, what are you moving forward? Or are you just moving forward? You've got to know that you have to move things forward. I can't stop doing what I'm called to do, even if I wanted to at a point point of time. I hated what we were doing, but I love what we're doing now because I know that I'm actually advancing what God wants and not just doing what I see other people doing. I was frustrated copying other people trying to compare to them and trying to be what they were doing, but I love what we're doing because I get to build disciples. The very reason why I stopped traveling was because I wanted disciples. Jesus, Jesus said, Jesus didn't say anything yet. Mama said to Jesus, whatever, well, I didn't even say Jesus, sorry, said to the servants, whatever he says, someone say do it. Now, do it is a great word because just do it is a powerful, powerful statement. Do it. Do you know, do you know that, that, that Nike was literally going out of business? They were going to bankrupt. They were, they, were, they were under some major pressure until they came up with this just do it. They came back, and I, I, have, I had the numbers, but I, I the numbers are just amazing. It's like $800 million to $3 billion on just do it. Just do it. Come on, somebody. The power that everyone could execute something. Oh, do it. Someone say, do it. Do it. It's the power of executing. It's the power of executing. It's the power of executing. A disciple is waiting for someone to execute. You need to know that there's a do it in your life. There's a just do it. And you have to know that that's where your increase comes. Now they have changed the whole look and the whole style of Nike is about someone. Anyone who didn't have potential before can rise up and do it. That person who didn't run could get up and run. They couldn't. I want you to know Jesus is the first just do it. And he's the one that is able. And if I can be honest, his mama was his disciple. And she said, do it. To make, the word do it is to make with the names of things made, to produce, to construct, to form, to fashion, to be the author of, to cause something, to execute, to, the, to appoint one anything, to appoint someone and ordain someone to do it. How many of you know when you're told to do something, you have an ordination from God? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Doesn't matter what it is. If someone's a hospitality, right? All of a sudden, hospitality. That's an ordination from God. It's no longer a secular thing. It's a sacred thing designed by God to be accomplished. It's an execution. It advances the movement forward. Yeah, am I talking to the right people? Are there any advancers in the house? Are there anybody that just said, give me something to do? Amen. We're looking with this pattern to understand that it's, it takes a twofold thing. It takes the power and the wisdom. It takes the power and the wisdom. The power is presence. The wisdom is leadership. The power is miracles, relevance, and the, and the organizational discipline is the wisdom. The power is being a disciple. And execution is the wisdom of how to push things into existence. The greatest thing you can do in this earth is make something out of your mind see, be seen by someone else. If people never see what you're dreaming of, you, you, will, you will waste your life. We're doing a Barrier Buster Challenge this week. And the Barrier Buster is called Beyond Barriers. And the, one of the things that I really wanted to bring out was the fact that there's going to be the, one of the wealthiest places on the earth is a graveyard. Miles Monroe said it. One of the gr- wealthiest places on the earth is the graveyard because people go to the grave with their dreams because they don't do it. They dream about it. They think of it. They hope of it. I'm, I'm, don't get depressed. Do it. Don't get discouraged. Do it. Don't get frustrated. 
Do it. I know. Get. Come on, pick it up. You're not in that graveyard yet. You're not in that graveyard. Don't you dare take it. You got about Don't you dare take it. You live that life and you do it now. Don't you? Well, I'm afraid. Don't you dare be. You don't you dare. You'll be afraid if you take it to the grave because one day you'll stand before God and he'll ask, why didn't you accomplish what I sent you to do? It's amazing. Jesus was bar mitzvah and he was in his season of bar mitzvah and he was about his father's business. He went to talk to the priest and he was talking to the priest. He got all excited because they were mesmerized. They were amazed by him. They couldn't understand where this guy get all this wisdom and all this insight and all this. And they're just, just amazing. He, his mama comes in and goes, we've been looking three days for you. Get over here. Get in, get in the cart. He's like, you should have known I've been by my father's business. Get in the cart. And the Bible says that she hid it in her heart. She, she, that's what a discipler does. A discipler takes the dreams of a disciple and puts it in their heart. And hides it in their heart looking for the right day to activate it. We hide, we hide it in our heart and we go, okay, we heard you, but I need you to get in the cart. We heard what you said, but I actually need you just to get in the cart because you have to learn something. And the Bible says he went and he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. He grew in power and wisdom. So there's a season where what you want will come to pass, but you've got to be grown up a little bit in some power and in some wisdom so that you can activate it when it's time to be activated. And so Jesus is sitting there with his disciples saying, it's not my time yet. Come on, somebody, because he knew when he thought it was his time, it wasn't his time. And he's been waiting all these years for it to be the time. And so she's the only one that's been hiding in her heart. And she can activate him right now because she's been dreaming for him to do this all this time. If I had someone here that would just say amen, that'd be so fun. So he, he, he's waiting. Woman, no, not, the, not, not today. I'm your, I'm your discipler today. Today I'm activating you. Whatever. He tells you to do. She didn't even answer his timing question. She didn't answer any of his stuff. Whatever he says, come on somebody. Whatever he says, you go and do that. Because this is what we do. We execute stuff when it's timing. And immediately, the power to function in that miracle working power was activated in him. He couldn't have done it when he was a teenager, but now he was ready. The timing was right. Let's look at this discipleship stuff for a second. First Corinthians 13, 13. First Corinthians 13, 13. This is what God says our discipleship is based upon. We, we, we must understand that what's the first thing he says about his disciples in Matthew. He says, go. Someone say, go. How many of you know that's a doing word? That's a do it word. Go. Go. Now that's not just choosing, that's a being sent to go. Go into all this world and make. That's a that's a doing word. Make disciples. Baptizing them. It's not right. It says baptizing them. It didn't say teaching them. Discipleship is a baptism. Baptizing them into the Father, into the Son, into the Holy Spirit. I want you to know that you need to embrace a baptism. 
When we're running around, we're getting 10,000 teachers, what the Bible says, but you only have one father. The father's the one that baptizes you. The teachers are what teach you. You need someone that's going to baptize you. Someone that's going to immerse you in what you are called. That's going to push you into what you're, that's going to dunk you and lower you, submit, submerse you completely in the calling of God on your life. Someone that's going to see it, nurture it, grow it. I wish I had an amen. That's going to... You have to understand that's what God wants. He wants you to know that there's someone hiding in their hearts what you've been talking about. But they know you've got to be immersed in it, not swim on it. He says, when you're, when you're going to go on my behalf, you go and you are looking for disciples to immerse in the calling of God. Immerse in the will of God. Immerse in the discipleship of God. And this is what we do in the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, 13, what God told us to do in our discipleship training. <clears throat> that we must focus on what abides. Someone say abides. That means it's housed. It lives forever. That which is abide. Now abides faith, hope, and love. These three, these three, they live forever. I want you to know that what we baptize you in and what our, our, our anointing of discipleship is in, it's not in the anointing of just, can, do you understand the Greek? And do you understand the, dip, the depth of that word? And do you understand what this means? And we're not even, even baptizing you in the re Hebrew roots. We're baptizing you in the understanding that there's faith, that there's hope, and that there's love. That you're always going to believe for it. You're always going to hope for it. You're always going to love and stand for it. Faith works with love and hope works with love. Everything works with love. That's why it says, but the greatest of all is love. When we can love someone and go beyond what they ever imagined you would go through with them. When you can show that kind of love, it builds faith, it builds hope, and it builds love. You baptize them in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Jesus came to manifest hope and our faith in that the power of the Holy Spirit moves us into all of these three. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit baptizing you completely in it. I'm telling you, I'm excited about this. And it builds within us a character that is unmovable, unshakable character. Character. I want you to know what God's looking for is character abides forever. And if our character is based upon faith, hope, and love, not based upon how much I know more than you. Because that's what the Bible says puffs up. If I know more than you, and it, I don't need to love you. I can look down at you. Because faith, faith doesn't look down at people. Faith lifts people up. Hope enters causes people to enter into a realm that they couldn't enter in it believes that they can step into something there's an expectation the word hope is the word expectation i literally expect great things from your life i do and that's frustrating the people <laughs> and love works to get it done character abides forever disciples have an, an eternal perspective which sets their actions. An eternal perspective, not a temporary perspective. Living from eternity is different than living from 2021. Yeah. People don't know how to live from eternity in 2021. Because they're talking about all the stuff that 2021 is talking about. But you and I should be talking about what eternity is talking about. Yeah. Eternity is not talking about 2021. It's a blink of an eye. It's a second. Yes. It's so quick. Right. It's a thousand years is a day to God. Yes. And you think he's having this long of a conversation on 2021? <laughs> That's the conversation way too long. How many of you ever been in a conversation that has gone too long? Yes. It's like, okay, I, I heard this already, right? Let's do it. But you have to understand. <laughs> Doers have a certain kind of character. Their character is based upon faith, hope, and love. God is a go. Sorry, go. God is a doing word. Go is a doing word. Someone say doing. doing. 
Now, I know that this is, this is not popular in the modern day because anything that I talk about in doing and discipleship in the modern day church is legalism. That's why we're not advancing. That's why I like coaching. That's why I like influencers. And I like reformers. It's because they expect you to tell them what to do. And then they do it because they're accountable. There's an accountability to it. But church, you can be told what to do and you can make up your mind if you want to or not. And we, we know the church for us is just a fishing pool for reformers and influencers. <laughs> oh, you made it. We got another one in there. Get on there. There's a reformer over there. Yeah, come on to church. Come on to church. Come on to church. What do you like to eat? I thought you were building a church. Yeah, kind of. But what we're, <laughs> kind of. What, what we do, we know it's a swimming pool with fish in it. And these fish have to be caught and discipled into something. Now, are you going to eat it on a boat? You going to eat it on a trike? Or you going to eat it on a bike? How are we? We're going to put you either in an influencer or in a reformer. But one way... We're going to get you to eat this fish. You're going to eat this. You're going to eat this. Why don't you just let us drink? You just... No, we can't. We can't. We're advancing. When we get to heaven, God's going to ask us, what? why didn't you advance me? I mean, that's a terrible thing. I know I, we don't want to talk about the end times and we don't want to talk about the judgment. And the, the, we don't want to talk about the judgment, the fact that God's going to stand you in front of judgment seat one day and you're going to say, well, why didn't you advance my kingdom? Well, I was so busy working. Ooh. So your job was so secular that it couldn't advance my kingdom. All right, so disciples make things happen. They don't wait for things to happen. All right, so let me finish with this. We're going into execution. You guys understand what discipleship looks like? Yeah. Brief, but we're going to revisit these things. Discipleship. Now, disciples are executors, which makes these two things an advancer. We're building a seed profile. We're going to profile you. Oh, you're in the advancer season. Oh, you're in the ruler season. Oh, you know what? We, we understand that you're in the builder season. We know how to work with you in that. Right? When someone told me, I said, well, when I first showed this to a bunch of business guys about five years ago, six years ago, I thought they would be at least here because they were meeting with me every week. I thought they'd be in this part because they, you know, talk about how they're leaders. So I thought they'd already, they'd be like here. And I said, where are you guys? What in, 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 and I would, I was actually just telling them what the vision looked like. And they said, well, we're about right here. I said, you're at, you're at the, where things are done f for you and miracles and signs and wonders. And you're not even here at the organizational discipline. No, we're just at the, we love the fact that we come to church and there's a great word every week. And we love the fact that there's miracles and we get prayer and prophecy. We love that. My face went like this, dropped all the way down to the ground. Yeah. And I was like, are you serious? I'm, I'm spending every, every week Tuesday with people who don't even consider themselves advancers of the organizational discipline. No wonder you're always fighting the systems. The people that fight the systems are so they're just consumer oriented. But when you understand the systems there to keep us from losing the power that God has given us systems and processes. They were, they were like, okay. And then I realized, okay, this is, this is, but now I have a, a profile for you. Yeah. I get to say, oh, you're in the builder stage and this doesn't sound negative. Cause I was like, oh, you just stupid. But the, the, but the fact is, is you're in the builder stage. Oh, you know what? You're in the ruler stage. You're dominating things. That's great. Now, the only way to rule is to not only just have a miracle, but let's put the organizational discipline. So thank God you got healed of diabetes. Let's make sure that you never eat that way again. 
So now we're in the execution. Someone say execution. I'm going to give you some influencers kind of concepts around execution for a second. It's going to be quick. Let's, let's go to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Romans 12, 1. It says here, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Someone say mercy. mercy. Now you have to understand what's going to be said here is God's mercy. What's going to be released here is God's mercy. It's not his grace. He's not killing you. He's not destroying you. He's giving you his mercy. He's giving you something that you don't deserve. Someone say it. I don't deserve it. Amen. Okay. By the mercies, he's saying this is, my, this is the mercy of God. By the mercy of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Because your body is really not acceptable to God. But you present it as if it's a living sacrifice. God would never accept it. Come on, somebody. It's not as good as the offerings that he asked for. I want you to get this. Present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your, someone say reasonable. Now, let me tell you the power of execution. The power of execution is, is being unreasonable. What he's asking you to do is something that is unreasonable to most people, but you call what is unreasonable, reasonable, that's execution. Well, if you, if you look at everybody God picked to use to, as a deliverer, he asked them to do unreasonable things to, that was, ba he never asked them to do reasonable things. He asked them to do unreasonable things. And when you ask someone to do something that's unreasonable, they have to be a disciple. Cause they, they can't, otherwise they'll have an argument of why they can't do it. They'll have an excuse of why they can't do it. They'll have a reason why it doesn't work for them. But if you know that they're disciples, someone who's laid down their lives, their, their bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, and that's my reasonable service. But to the world, that's unreasonable. When you do what is God's asking you to do, and it's completely unreasonable, it's unreasonable that you would give every waking moment to God. It's completely unreasonable. But an executed disciple life gives every moment of their lives to God. Gives every one of the things that they have in their hearts to God. Jesus, think of 13, 12 years old, is father's business. Go home. Submit to, submit to, and found favor with God and man. And look what happens to him. He's 30 years old. From 12 to 30 years old, 18 years, he submits all that stuff that's been in his heart. That was in his heart 18 years ago. It's unreasonable that you would ask me to put it. You, it's unreasonable that you would ask me. Yeah, because that's what it is. It was unreasonable when God asked me, no, 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 you can't go to Hollywood and do what you're called to do. You're called to be a prophet. But I want to go to Hollywood. I want to be an actor. I said, he, I said, that's all I want to do. I don't want to be one of those broke Christian preachers. He goes, no, it, it, no you're going to do this. I need you to do this for me. It, are you my disciple? I'll do anything for you, Lord. I'll do anything for you. People say, Tracy, why don't you go and do this, 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 this? Because I have to live an unreasonable execution. An unreasonable execution. Come on, somebody. An unreasonable execution. Reasonable service demands unreasonable execution. You have to understand that. Reasonable service has a great reason behind it. It demands unreasonable execution. To consistently, this is the word execution, to consistently do the right things in accordance, at least this is my definition, to do the right things in accordance to the, your value and vision and, and breed or brand if you're in business. But because we're talking about a kind of believer, we're talking about a breed of person, a new breed. To consistently do the right things in accordance to your value your vision and your brand slash breed. 
we're kind of breed. We're kind, we're kind of believer. When the Lord said, Tracy, you keep talking about revival, but Paul never talked about revival. I said, what are you talking about? He said he talked about a kind of believer. When we talk about revival, we're not talking about having services. We're talking about raising up a kind of believer, an unreasonable believer. That do, we do unreasonable things. We have unreasonable demands. Listen, I, if you've ever been around a bodybuilder, they're unreasonable. They eat in a very certain way. Now, the more, the more unreasonable you are, it just means simply, if I can put it in different terms, the more certain things you do. You have to do things in a certain way to get the certain response. If I can teach this, if I can never get people to hear that, there's a, you have to do things in a certain way to get a certain response, the certain reaction, the certain execution. You can't just do it in any way you want to. There's a certain way it works. And if you realize that certain way takes an unreasonable execution. And so you have to correct. I took this out of my notes, but I'm going to keep it there. I'm going to, I'm going to come back to it. I'm going, I'm going to tell you later. I'm going to tell you later. It's going to be harsh. It's going to be strong. Not harsh. It's going to be strong. But this was written for, this was written for influencers. <laughs> this part. Because I took it out of my influencers notes. And I put it in. And I haven't tied it to the local. Inf the reason, the, so I want you to get this. You disciples. There you go. That's the word of the Lord. You consistently do the right thing in the right ways in accordance to your vision, your values, and your behavior. Now, and now you have to know that your behavior has to be associated to your brand. Someone says, what's your brand? They're talking about what's your behavior. What's the same behavior every single time? A person's brand can't shift, which means that they have to behave that way every single time. Right? So I hear only good things about Jackie's business. It's because she behaves a certain way every single time. It's the behavior. She's consistently executing. Come on, somebody. Consistently executing exactly every single time. That is the power of execution. But you have to be unreasonable. So when someone comes and works with you and they don't do it, the same behavior, the same values, then you help them and you disciple them into your behavior. Mm. You disciple them into your vision. You disciple them into the, the same attitudes. You're tracking with me. Well, that's the power of discipleship. Now they come to work with you to learn of you, not to just get paid by you. I mean, if you're going for a paycheck, don't go for a pay Do nothing for a paycheck. No, Learn of a behavior. You understand? We said, you know, we had to say no to so many invitations to be, take over this large church, take over this large church, take over this large church. And they say, we're going to give you this kind of house. We're going to give you this kind of car. We're going to give you this kind of thing. Well, can I pray for the sick? No. Like, well, I can't do that. I can't, I can't, because I have a behavior that says the kingdom of God loves sick people to, into health. And so take your big church. Take your big whatever else. <laughs> Eat it. <laughs> Eat it. My wife, my wife has volunteered new words for me. <laughs> she's filled my mouth with good things <laughs> can I give you two more points well three more points on this this execution okay so this is important the first key to being unreasonable <laughs> you ready the first key to being unreasonable is setting performance and behavioral Standards. <laughs> the first key to being unreasonable. Now, listen, listen, the key to executing anything, the president of the United States or whoever else it is, they, the only reason that person stays in their position, position is because they can execute something. The moment they can't execute something, whatever they're, someone's going to take them out. I'm not, don't, Facebook, don't shut me off. I'm not taking him out. 
or tell anybody. It's no secret little, like. <laughs> but that's why people get fired. That's why in climates like this, people don't, they don't get hired or they don't stay. It's because there's an unreasonable standard and behavior that's in place that they're expecting. You don't become excellent at anything by being reasonable about everything. The first key is to be unreasonable in setting performance. How you want it to perform and behavior. The next thing I want to say is constructively in, in this unreasonable state, constructively in constructively intolerant, be in cons, be constructively intolerant about performance and behavioral variances every time, every time. That means when you see it going a little slanted, so you know what, what I, what I, what we really do is we don't just, we don't just pick up the crumbs with our fingers. This is Jackie talking to people. We don't pick <laughs> with our fingers, but we actually have a broom and a, and a dustpan. Go ahead and just and sweep that in there make sure you get around the corners really good. And then, you know, to, right. That's being, that's, and if you see the variances, you see them coming back, then you go, Oh, by the way, let's, let's just remember that, that our standard, our behavioral standard is. We don't pick it up with our fingers. Remember, you're doing it again. Here's the dustpan. And you keep on it. And I know it sounds like nagging, but it's the fact is the only way we're going to have that performance every single time is to be constructively. That means keep teaching, keep training, keep discipling. As long as they're willing to be a disciple, then that's fine. At the moment they start to give you fluff, then they're no longer your disciples, and then you can invite them to leave. That made me too strong because I am talking to church people. I felt like I was talking to disciple leaders. <laughs> yeah, it's like you can invite them to, 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 to have a lateral movement. <laughs> Constructively... Be constructively intolerant about performance and behavioral variances every time. Can I tell you, this is where I believe that we are, is in execution. We're, re we're revisiting execution in our church. And I think I'm going to spend the next year on it. Until it's in our DNA again. Because that's when we, that's when we really took off, is when I spent a year on execution. And I taught this same thing over and over, over and over that we're constructively intolerant about perf performance and behavioral variances. Now, listen, this is important that we next part is to be flexible about everything that doesn't require disciplined execution. So you you can be you what needs disciplined execution, you're intolerant. But whatever you don't need disciplined execution. Oh, yeah, let's just chill on it. Yeah, do whatever, whatever. Right. You understand? You have to have that freedom. You have to have that freedom. Yeah, whatever. That's fine. That's great. Go ahead. Whatever you think. But listen, we have to make sure that people really are smiling and having a good time. Is that okay? That's my standard, right? We're smi people have to be, okay, yeah, that's great. As long as people, but remember, people are going to be smiling and have a good time, right? Yes. Okay. But can we, can we put wigs on their heads? As long as they're smiling and having a good time, yeah, I'm going to be flexible about that. If they're open to it, but if they stop smiling and have a good time, you got to get rid of the wigs. You understand what, what's, what's the, what's the unreasonable thing is we're going to make sure that people are smiling and having a good time. How we, how, whatever we do around there, whatever flexible thing you want to do, you want to make sure that everybody has a lay, lay coming. That's right. Come and put, put, put the flowers on them. That's fine. Are they smiling? Okay. They're smiling. Good. This is what this, we, we, we pay attention to those things. That's the, we pay attention to what's we keep unreasonable. We need disciplined execution on that. That's what we pay attention to. The other stuff we can have flexibility on it. Amen. So Jesus is there with his disciples. His mom says, take care of this, do this. He says what he said. Then she turns to the servants. Whatever he tells you to do, you do it. Someone say execute it. Execute, execute what he tells you to do. 
He says to the people, the servants, you see those water pots right there? There's six water pots. They're about this tall. Maybe a little bit shorter. They're wide mouth. And they're mint, they're ceremonial washing pots. Meaning when you come into the wedding, your hands are dirty, your feet dirty. You go and wash in those. So you can see the ring of, you can see the, you can see, you can see the bath, the bath ring, just, just going down, and you can see about four, five, six, or seven rings in there. That's like that's 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 Hebrew feet walking in the sand, you got dusty feet, right? Camels poop stuff all over the place, and there's six of them. You have to wash before you come in. You can't come in this thing, thing dirty. You got to clean it up. Everybody. And Jesus chooses that. See, because he's being, see, what, what, is, what, what is the, what is the, in, what's the, what's the thing that he must do? What's the, what's the unreasonable thing that he must do? He must have wine. Mom must have a lot of wine, but mom didn't tell me how I had to do it. Do you see, do you see the flexibility here? I want you to see it because it's the re it's, there's an unreasonable. There's got to be good wine. But then there's got to be some, there's some flexibility. Mom said, whatever. And Jesus, a little bit of a joker. Come on, Jesus. He's like, fill those pots up with some water. That means that they were full and now they went down because people's feet and hands have been. So he has to go and fill them up again. I think it's something like 33 gallons. Six of them. These servants are working. They didn't clean it. They just filled it up. Now, I, I want you to get this. There's a reasonable and then there's unreasonable. And what's unreasonable is we must have wine. What, what's flexible is you can do it as long as you manifest the result. Move us forward here. Advance us here. Execute this thing. She walks off. She has no idea. So he's going, he's with his boys. Get those water pots. And as they were bringing it back, they, 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 they just, they, they know what's in there. And Jesus says, now dip in there and take that and let the master of the, the feast taste it. Now this guy, he has, he has a taste bud. He, he, he will know if there's feet fungus in there. He will know. Now we're, uh, <laughs> he got some, <laughs> he knows, he, he's the master of this. He knows. I don't know where this wine came from, but it got a couple of toenails in it. Okay, no. We still have to eat, sorry. So the masters of the feast taste it. And he's like, those guys are trying to sneak off. If you read it, it looks like they're trying to sneak off. And the Bible says he called them back. Come back in here. Can you imagine? Can you imagine them coming back in? Get back in here. They're like, they're ready to say, we're telling on Jesus. We're telling on Jesus. And then he goes, this is the best. This is the best. Most people wait to, they give their worst at the end. Can you imagine? <laughs> They're like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we do. 
<laughs> That's how we do. <laughs> Verse 11 is really interesting to me. Verse 11 says, and from this point on, his disciples believed in him. After seeing his first miracle. See, they followed him before, but they didn't believe in him to want to be like him. How they believed in him. When you execute Execution will create belief in you. When you execute, people will believe in you. And they will follow you to want to become like you, learn of you, be trained of you. Amen? Amen. 